Howdy there once again YouTube. My name is Ben Ferriolo and I'm dedicated to the responsible and accurate seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. First off, if you have not already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided under my email address in the description box below. It contains a great deal of information including how to understand the many types of plots and charts people use, how to find, access, and analyze seismic data, and now how to find, access, and analyze GPS data. And it also contains hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images regarding a great many seismic events and swarms on many different pages. I want to give you guys a heads up. I know probably not that many of you, but some of you have been waiting for that GPS deformation video that I was talking about for quite a while. Uh, it took me a good week, you know, because I got hung up on something. I had some other stuff to do, and also I was having a very hard time understanding how to do what I was trying to do, but I figured it out and I created the video. It's the video just right before this one. But really that doesn't matter because I do have a section on my website under the how to drop down menu called read, create your own GPS charts or whatever it says. So you guys could go ahead and check that out if you want. It's very good. If you want to see multiple years of GPS deformation, I just suggest using the online GPS deformation charts provided by USGS. I'm, I, I just use those if I want to see multiple years. But if you want to see a time period of like, three months, six months, nine months to a year or something like that, then I suggest creating your own GPS charts because you can't really see the difference between really half a year or so because the GPS deformation charts online don't show as much detail as it should. It would be nice if they have like an option allowing you to zoom in on the charts to see each day because, you know, each sample is taken each day. So it'd be a lot better, a lot easier to see the actual changes occurring at that level. So yeah, my GPS deformation video is out on how to make your own GPS charts on how to understand them. Again, it is the video just before this one, so go check that out now if you want, but it'll always be on my website under the how-to drop-down menu, so you don't have to even do that right now. I'm making this video. I was not planning on it. Uh, this next couple weeks from now till about a month from now, it's going to be pretty busy, guys. I'm still going to be putting out content and notifi notifying you guys, excuse me. If anything concerning may occur, I still will do that. But I may not be reporting on as much stuff as before, simply because the next month or so is going to be pretty busy for me. Uh, so I was not going to do a video today, but I found out there are some interesting things occurring. Apparently there was a magnitude 5.5 earthquake in Hawaii, which I believe is the largest earthquake to occur since the activity calm. We'll look at that at the end, at last. And then the other two things I want to talk about is the recent seismicity at Yellowstone. We did have two earthquakes pop off there this morning. And also I want to look at the real-time tremor map showing the ETS episodic tremor and slip, also called slow slip event that is currently occurring in Washington State on the Olympic Peninsula. So first thing I want to talk about is the current ETS episodic tremor and slip, also called slow slip event that is occurring in this area right here of the Olympic Peninsula, the eastern, the northeastern tip of the Olympic Peninsula right in this area. I live right there. Yes, I do. And remember, the Cascadia subduction zone is within the warning time frame of another Cascadia megathrust event. I personally don't believe it will happen in a few years. I think it's going to be a good decade. I believe, unless something really does kickstart it to happen, then I think it happened a lot sooner. However, the Seattle fault line, I would not be surprised if that ruptured tomorrow. The Seattle fault line hasn't ruptured for 1,100 years. The Cascadia subduction zone last ruptured, what was it? 394 years ago. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Or is it 319 years? No, wait, because it occurred in the year 1700, right? 1700 plus 300. That would obviously be 2,000, right? And plus 19 years from 2,000 to right now. So that is 319. Okay, so it's been 319 years, not 394, which is well within the warning time frame for another mega thrust event. We don't know when that'll happen, but a thing to keep an eye on is the ETS events. I've been wondering why seismicity has been increasing lately. You can see that we do have... Mount St. Helens did have a, a good increase in seismicity the other day. Not too crazy. Cascade volcanoes are still extremely quiet, except for, I believe for one 1.2 earthquake at Mount Rainier. But I noticed, look at this line of earthquakes right here. The Seattle Fault Line runs just like this, parallel to this line of seismicity. So this line of seismicity runs parallel to the Seattle Fault. Again, the, C the Cascadia subduction zone, I believe, has ruptured two or three times since the Seattle Fault ruptured. You know what I'm saying? The Seattle Fault ruptured 1,100 years ago, but the Cascadia one ruptured 319 years ago. 
I believe the Seattle Fault is definitely overdue in any ETS episode, which can be a precursor to larger earthquakes. I wouldn't be surprised if it ruptures tomorrow, guys. I would not be surprised. But seismicity, in my opinion, this is the past seven days for Oregon and Washington. I believe it is increasing a little bit. That is what I believe because it has not been this crazy months and months and months ago. A lot, of the, a lot of the concentration of the earthquakes are happening in Mount St. Helens and near Seattle and the Olympic Peninsula right here. Again, the ETS tremor, slow slip tremor, is occurring right here. Let's go take a look at that right now. Okay, so it has slightly calmed down since I saw it last night. 1.2 hours of tremor in the last three hours as of 11.21 a.m. March 13th, 2019. And I live in Pacific time, obviously. So this is the epicenter of the slow slip that we were currently seeing the past day or two. Let's go to the past 12 hours. Seven hours of tremor. That's more than half of these 12 hours right here. You can see them popping off and in which locations, which is nice. Wow. Very interesting, guys. Let's go to the past 48 hours, the past two days of slow slip. Ha again, it has been occurring on the northeastern tip of the Olympic Peninsula. Here's Seattle. The Seattle Fault Line runs just like this, right across the area right there. Again, the Seattle Fault Line has not ruptured for 1,100 years. The Cascadia Subduction Zone last ruptured 319 years ago. So I think, again, the Seattle Fault will produce a magnitude 7 event before the Cascadia Subduction Zone event occurs. That is what I truly believe. But I could be very wrong about that, guys. I could be very wrong. So we do have an ETS episode currently occurring, but it's not too crazy. The ones that were occurring last year were pretty crazy. So we'll keep an eye on this. That is for sure, because I live right here, so I'm definitely going to keep an eye on it. Because this always, they say, obviously, this doesn't mean an earthquake is coming. But it does, it does increase the chance of an earthquake. It does. The past 24 hours of seismicity in the world as of 11.23 a.m. Pacific Time, March 13, 2019. Again, there was a magnitude 5.5 at 6.7 kilometers in depth at Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii, which personally I believe this is the largest earthquake to occur since the eruptions calmed in late... What was it? It was about August, right? I think it was about August or September that the eruptions calmed last year. Now, notice we also have a magnitude 2.3 in Alabama. I did a blog post. If you want to go, go to my website, go to my Seismo blog, and go to, I think it's the most recent post, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's the most recent post that deals with the magnitude 3.1 in Alabama, which occurred on the border between Alabama and the Florida Panhandle. This earthquake appears to have occurred in the same location. I believe this is the third earthquake, magnitude 2.0 and above, that has occurred in this location in the past week. So, why is seismicity starting to increase down near the Florida Panhandle? I mean, of course, earthquakes can occur anywhere at any time, but that's a very strange location for an increase in earthquakes. Then we see Colorado is seeing another increase in seismicity, most likely aftershocks from the magnitude 4.5 that we saw a little more than a week ago. Washington State had two earthquakes, most likely caused by, actually, where is that from? Snoqualmie, hey! Okay, that's not too far from where I live. I live right there, so eh, it doesn't look like anybody felt it. It was only a 1.4. And now here we are at Yellowstone. Let's zoom into Yellowstone and see the ones they're reporting. Now, they're only reporting four earthquakes. A 0 0.3 at 8.8 .8 kilometers in depth, a 2.8 at 7.9, 0 0.8 at 4.8, and a 2.3 at 3.5. Now, if you, uh, in my blog post as well, I talk about the two earthquakes that occurred south of the promontory, which this is the promontory right here, was stationed YTP. Just south, two earthquakes struck right here on, what was it, March 11th, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong again, March 11th. Go to my Seismo blog where I talk about that as well. And uh, they located the earthquakes pretty well. The earthquakes did definitely occur in this area according to the P and S wave arrivals uh, arriving on each station. Remember, if you have, let's say you have an array of seismographs around the location of where you think an earthquake occurred, and then you have a seismograph right in the middle, the closest seismic station will be the one to see the P wave arrive first. So that means you can judge the direction that an earthquake is coming from and judge which station is the closest station without even having to locate the earthquake. Of course, locating an earthquake is always important and definitely should be done. But you can also do that to judge the number of earthquakes within an earthquake swarm that cannot be located. Because sometimes they are not able to be located if the P waves are not 
properly recorded on these stations, but still, you should always try your best to report every single earthquake. So let's first deal with this one right up here. This one was a magnitude 2.8, was pretty strong and showed up across the entire caldera. Actually, I think every single station, pretty much every single station that is operational in Yellowstone did detect this event, which is basically what we should see for a magnitude 2.8 occurring at this depth. That's normal. Again, seismic waves propagate away from their source like a ripple in a pond. That's exactly how they work. So the closest seismic station will always see the P wave arrive first. That way you can tell, was it a teleseism? Was it from across the world? Or was it from south of Yellowstone Lake? Was it from north of Yellowstone Lake? Was it from west of Yellowstone Lake? You know what I'm talking about. It's very easy to find that out. Okay, so we do, again, have 2.8, 7.9. And then down here, we do have the 2.3 at 3.5. Occurred at 1649 UTC. And this one occurred at 1313 UTC. So let's see, the closest seismic station to this magnitude 2.8 at Yellowstone. I already know what the closest seismic station is to the earthquake south of YTP. Uh, we might not use YTP though, because it's that station does not record earthquakes very well at all. So YML, Marion Lake, detected this event first. So did this earthquake occur at Mary Lake? Actually, yeah, it's starting. Let me turn on terrain just real quick, shall we? Mary Mountain and Mary Lakes up to the northeast. So it occurred very close to the lower geyser basin. Again, in my seismo blog on my website, my most recent blog post detailed a small burst in seismicity that we saw at the lower geyser basin. Remember, the upper geyser basin is far to the south. You'd think the upper geyser basin would be up here, right? No, it's not. Upper geyser basin is right here where Old Faithful is. Because this is the upper geyser basin, midway geyser basin, and lower geyser basin, according to the map. So why don't we take a look at the magnitude 2.8, and let me just make sure that it's YTP. Actually, this, this earthquake occurred a little bit farther south, it looks like, than the two other earthquakes that occurred last time in that location. So let's just real quick look at the closest seismic station, if we can. Sorry if my computer's getting too slow. Come on, buddy. Come on. All right, arrival time, YTP. Okay, Be a borehole 944 uh, detected at second. I'm going to use borehole 944 just to look at it real quick. Here's the data for seismic station YML for March 13th, 2019. Short period vertical in the WY Network 01 location code. Let's move forward. Here's the magnitude 2.8, which they state occurred at, what was it, 7.9 kilometers in depth. And it traveled pretty far, so the depth does look like it's correct. Upwards going P waves showing possibly compression. If Iris was correct on that, it looks like the amplitudes were cut because it went beyond the preset margin of 32,000 amplitude count. Basically, if anything goes beyond 32,000 amplitude count for the specific short period stations in the WY network, it usually gets cut. That's why I actually like the broadband stations much better. Much better. But let's go to the spectrogram. Notice we have dominant lower frequencies. I was expecting to see how, of course, though, of course, we do still see strong frequencies going well beyond 25 hertz. I mean, let's put the maximum frequency to 55. Won't go to 55, but it'll go to 50. But if it did go to 55, I bet it would go beyond 55. Let's look at the spectra plot, shall we? Let's see what the dominant frequencies are of this event. Well below 10 hertz. So let's turn log frequency on. That is very strange. I don't know what that means. It says there's power at the zero hertz level. I mean, 0, 0.00000, nothing. How can nothing have power? I think that's strange. But we see a few spikes. And they don't look like spikes. They look like rounded humps, That which I think is very... I don't know what that is caused by, actually. But the dominant frequencies remain between about one hertz. And it starts to die down. Let's see, the strongest frequency was about 3.2 hertz and dies down around 5 hertz or so and goes down and down and down and down. So, of course, this was not a low frequency event, but we did have mid-range dominant frequencies. Not too low. They could have been a little bit lower, but again, this was the magnitude 2.8. at 7.9 kilometers in depth at Yellowstone, which occurred just southwest of Mary Lake, near the lower geyser basin, actually. So, what is changing, guys? What is changing? We had another aftershock right there, another aftershock right there. Let's check out the spectrogram. Let's let's put this back, or shall we, to 25, the preset margin of 25. Mid-range frequencies on the aftershocks, which I thought was very interesting. Check out the spectra plot. 
dominant frequencies remaining, we do see some strengths though, going beyond 10 hertz. So it's not a low frequency event, but I think it's very interesting how they do have some dominant mid-range frequencies, which is very interesting. Let's go forward. Multiple aftershocks, multiple aftershocks. One right there too. And then I believe this one was reported probably in 1.0 or something like that. Multiple other aftershocks throughout the day to there. And then this one right here, this one on YML, this is the magnitude 2.3 that occurred south of the promontory. And then on YML in the past, what, half hour or so? Because it's 11.34 a.m. Pacific time, March 13, 2018. Some strange, strange, small emergent event appeared on station YML. Stopped and then continued a little bit. I do not know if this is tremor or if this is surface noise because I can't having a little bit of a hard time finding on surrounding stations is probably there i haven't spent too much time looking for it so it's probably there don't take my word for it dominant mid-range frequencies it's not a low if this really is some type of real seismic tremor it's not a low frequency tremor because the dominant frequencies stop at about what nine hertz or so so and they don't even go below one hertz really so very interesting now let's take a look Let's close this out and go to borehole 944 and let's see, precision rescale off, 95 for the overlap for the spectrogram. Let's see, some strange background activity. It has been occurring on both borehole 208 and borehole 944. Doesn't really look like much because it's very tiny, guys. Very, very weak, but it is occurring in the lower frequency band, which I think is very interesting. So let's pan this down, shall we? Again, here's the magnitude 2.8 that occurred at 7.9 kilometers in depth, somewhat near Mary Lake, somewhat near it. But right here is the earthquake, the 2.3, which occurred at, I forget, at 3.5 kilometers in depth was the 2.3, and that's this one right here, as shown on borehole 944, which was the second closest seismic station to this event. Personally, I think this earthquake was a little bit deeper than what they are stating. I personally think that. But I did not want to focus on this too much, a Yellowstone. Yes, Yellowstone is seeing somewhat of an increase in seismicity as of late. But I want to talk about Hawaii. Okay, so to the main course, we had a magnitude 5.5 in Hawaii at 6.7 kilometers in depth. In the past 24 hours, as of 11.36 a.m. Pacific time, there have been 15 earthquakes. So not too major. The count is not major. Maybe a few unreported microquakes in there, but that's basically it. Let's see exactly where this magnitude 5.5 occurred. Now, the middle rift zone is currently being refilled by magma. They said it's it's a, almost a constant supply, at least according to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. There is magma refilling in this area. Here's Kilauea, right here. Uh, well, at least what's left of Kilauea. Puoo. Puoo craters right about here, and the Leilani Estates fissures and fissure, what was it, fissure 8? Was it fissure 8 that turned into a cone? Oh, I forget. I believe it was fissure 8, right? That's down in this area right here, near Leilani Estates. So this earthquake occurred between Kilauea and Puoo, but farther to the south, though. Again, 5.5 at 6.7 kilometers in depth. This earthquake was upgraded. Contrary to what you hear, and you know, I agree that earthquakes are downgraded too much by the USGS. I agree that sometimes some should not be downgraded, but this was a 5.3 when it started last night, guys. They upgraded it from a 5.3 to a 5.5. So contrary to what you hear, they do upgrade earthquakes from time to time. But then again, they do downgrade earthquakes too much. So let's click on the 5.5, shall we? Let's, again, it's 6.7 kilometers in depth. How many people reported feeling it? Let's see. 313 people reported feeling it. Wow, that's a lot of people. So this was a pretty strong earthquake, guys. Look at the moment tensor. Look at this. Now, these moment tensors that you see that look like a fried egg pattern. Number one, this fried egg pattern is much like the same moment tensor that is shown for the Mayotte event. Number two, this fried egg pattern usually, I'm just saying usually, shows that something did collapse. Sometimes, guys, I'm not saying that's for sure, but to me this is not looking like a tectonic event whatsoever. To me this does look like some type of collapse event, possibly caused by the refilling of the magma. And I do have to say Kilauea has been steaming a little bit more than usual lately, 
the conduit is blogged, excuse me, plugged. So let's go to HBO, HBO webcams. And I'll leave a link to this below in the description box. If I don't, please just shoot me a comment and I'll put it in there if I forget. So east wide angle. Let's look at how Killaway is looking right now. So this is what it should look like. Usually it steams like this. It looks like it's steaming a little bit more than usual, but I don't know the temperature there. So I don't know. But this morning there was actually a steam plume that came from Killaway, guys. Like there's actually like a puffed out of plume. Now, this is the new camera right here, Overlook Vent Wide Angle from HBO Observation Tower. Nope, never mind. I am wrong. Holly Mama Crater from the rest, West Rim. Please be right. Yep, here it is. Okay, this is it right here. This is one of their research cameras that they have set up looking into the crater. Now, you cannot see the absolute bottom of the crater, but you can see like 95% of it. Look at how it's dropped, guys. Look at that. And it is starting to steam from the bottom a little bit more than usual. Could magma be starting to come back into the system? If so, remember this system, this conduit is plugged. It's been sinking and subsiding for a long time, ever since the eruption started. Of course, it stopped subsiding like crazy, but still, it's plugged down there, guys. If, if, the, if the magma tries to come back to kill away itself, we will see explosive eruptions again. I guarantee you 100% we will see explosive eruptions again. But look at that. I love this new camera looking right into there. I mean, man, except I think this camera will get destroyed if explosive eruptions happen again, though. Okay, so we do see again that there is a magnitude 5.5 earthquake just to the southeast of Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. Could the eruptions be starting again? I don't know. We will have to wait and see what the volcano update says. We'll go check that out in just a second, but I again just real quick wanted to see if this was the largest earthquake to occur at Kilauea in the Kilauea area since the eruptions calmed. So we're going to, this is how you do it. So I'm going to do a magnitude 4.9 minimum. So no earthquakes below 4.9 will be shown. Then I want to do 2018 and then I want to do, what was it? I want to do, let's see, it calmed in August, right? So I'm just going to do 8-1, so August 1st, right? August 1st to right now. I'm gonna do custom. I'm gonna turn off the rectangle, go into Hawaii, if it'll let me, and draw a rectangle around Hawaii. There we go, use this region. Okay, now we're gonna see all the earthquakes, magnitude 4.9 and above, that have occurred since August 1st. August 2nd was the last volcanic explosion at Kilauea. It was very weak, and that's this one right here. So, again, the magnitude 5.5 in Hawaii is definitely the largest earthquake we have seen at Hawaii since the eruptions calmed. Definitely, 100% for sure. Very interesting. Again, at 6.7 kilometers in depth and 313 people reported feeling the earthquake. And there's the moment tensor, which makes it look like this was a collapse earthquake. An earthquake caused by a collapse. We'll look at the waveform data in just a second, but I want to look at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory's notice on this, if they have one. Very surprisingly, they have not. They have not put out an update. The update was issued yesterday, guys, on March 12th, yesterday. So they still have not talked about this magnitude 5.5, which again is the largest earthquake to occur since the eruptions calmed in Hawaii. Something, I believe it's ramping back up, guys. I believe it is. Again, GPS stations and tilt meters continue to show motions consistent with refilling of the deep east rift zone magma reservoir. Sulfur dioxide emission rates from the summit in Pu'o'o remain very low. Again, remember guys, that can change in the blink of an eye. Now, let's take a look at some of the seismic data. First, I'm going to show you some seismic data from Kilauea Caldera itself. And then I'm going to show you some seismic data from the closest seismic station, excuse me, to the magnitude 5.5. Now here we are in the program swarm. We have the seismic data, the most recent data from OTLD, which resides right here on the southern rim of Kilauea Caldera. Notice OTLD, Kilauea Caldera, right on the southern rim. So let's see, persistent rescale is off, 95 is set for the overlap. So let's move forward, shall we? Notice that before we did have a low frequency event occur at Kilauea Caldera. Notice that that could have been a precursor to this 5.5. I'm not saying it is, but it could have been a precursor to the magnitude 5.5. Again, a low frequency earthquake. Let's check out the dominant frequency of this event. I'm not saying it's a low, low frequency earthquake. Yeah, you know, it does have some higher frequencies. Okay, so this is not a low frequency earthquake. I'm wrong. I'm sorry about that. 
but it does have dominant mid-range frequencies and does not really go beyond 10 hertz. Here, let's take a look at the spectrogram one more time. Let's take a look. Notice that it barely goes beyond 10.6 hertz. So that's very interesting. Now let's zoom out twice. There we go, let's go forward. There's a tiny, 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 very insignificant low frequency background tremor, but that could just be part of the normal background microseisms. I don't know. Because when the eruptions were occurring, the harmonic volcanic tremor episodes were much stronger, guys. Much stronger. I mean, it went all the way up to like 5, 6 hertz. It was so strong. Keep going forward, keep going forward. And here's the magnitude 5.5 as seen from the station at Kilauea Caldera. I want you to notice something. Remember the fried egg moment tensor that we saw? It looked like a fried egg. That usually means it was some type of collapse event. Again, showing dilation, a downwards dipping P wave like all of the other stations in the area are showing shows dilation, at least according to IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institute for Seismology. Now going forward, we do see another aftershock right here. Another aftershock, another aftershock, multiple aftershocks actually occurring in rapid fire sequence. Very tiny, very tiny, very tiny. Then we see a bunch more aftershocks, guys. Look at them all. There's a lot of them. And then we see some type of strange event. Dominant high, high definitely high range frequencies, guys. Definitely. It looks like surface noise. But I cannot rule out this actually being a real event. I cannot do it. Because Hawaii sometimes has some very strange events, guys. Trust me. Very strange events related to its magmatic activity. Can we see another aftershock here? And then all of a sudden, let's keep going forward. Notice all of a sudden the data stream starts to get corrupted. Notice this. Is this actually the data stream getting corrupted or is something going on with the monitor and the ground around the monitor? It is possible this could be real, but to me, this looks like an electronic problem. We could still see the earthquakes and any possible tremors, so it doesn't really get in the way too much unless you're looking on the waveforms. But let, yeah, look at the waveforms, guys. Doesn't look like an earthquake to me, does it? <laughs> All right, let's go forward with the spectrogram. Not seeing much, not seeing much. Many earthquakes, many aftershocks. Now let's go to right now. Look at this. Look at this event right here. It looks like a spaceship. <laughs> look at that. Dominant high range, mid to high range frequencies. Only going to about 400 amplitude count on this station. Could be a rock fall. I am thinking that there has been an increase in rock falls lately because of this earthquake, the magnitude 5.5. So I'm thinking something changing, guys. If it decides to return to Kilauea Caldera, we will see renewed volcanic eruptions. Explosive ones. Because it might be trying to make a new lava lake. You never know. Now, let's click out of this. Let's go to the closest seismic station to the magnitude 5.5, just so we can get a clearer look. It's an overlap to 95, persist to rescale off. Now, far before the actual earthquake, we did see an earthquake right here with dominant lower frequencies, which I thought was interesting. Keep going forward, keep going forward. We still see that lower frequency tremor. Very weak, very low frequency, but the thing is it could be part of the normal lower frequency band, the microseisms. So I don't know for sure if that's real or not. I don't know. Then we see an event right here. Looks like a low frequency event to me. I believe that's the one that we looked at on the other station that we said was a mid-range frequency event. Again, going forward, going forward. All of a sudden, boom! There is the magnitude 5.5. It's 6.7 kilometers in depth, which the moment tensor is suggesting could be a collapse event. That's a big collapse event, guys. So let's zoom in right here. Check out the dominant frequencies, shall we? Log power off. Dominant frequencies start at about 0.6 hertz and ends at about 3 hertz with the tallest, the strongest frequency being 1.8 hertz and weaker frequencies going 4.6 hertz and beyond. So let's turn log power back on. Go back to the spectrogram real quick. So there it is right there. Let's go to the waveforms. And it is showing an upwards going P wave most likely because it is closer to the epicenter. Again, guys, remember, I'm still learning all this stuff. I'm still having a hard time learning all this stuff. So, cut me a little slack. <laughs> Multiple aftershocks again, as we saw on Seismic Station OTLD. The tail of the earthquake lasted a long time. Aftershocks, 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 aftershocks. Over and over and over and over, occurring at such rapid succession. Now, this is what we should see if it was a collapse event. Because a collapse event wouldn't just be one earthquake and a few aftershocks. I mean, it'd be like rockfall, rockfall, rockfall. Because imagine something collapsing like an underground cavern. It doesn't just stop collapsing once the collapsing's done. Like, there's still rocks that are going to fall and that, that'll create earthquakes too. 
And more and more and more Aftershocks. And we had another Aftershock right here, which I believe was reported, what, 1.5 or something like that? I don't know. I'd have to check. And we see three Earthquakes right there. Another couple Earthquakes there. More Aftershocks, more Aftershocks. As of the most recent data stream, as of around 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time, we do see nothing. So... So, could this be leading to another volcanic eruption or another increase in volcanism for the Big Island of Hawaii? I think it could. I think it is signaling something is changing, just like the past earthquakes did with the eruptions in mid-2018. But again, we will have to wait and see. I hope you guys enjoyed, and do not forget to check out my website and all the things on my website. I got a link to it in the description box below. Also, do not forget to go check out the video just before this one, if you are interested in making your own GPS charts for shorter time periods than the USGS allow. Let me know what you think of this. I hope you guys have a great day and God bless.